Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello, and welcome to Garden Success. Now, we're normally a call-in show, but today I'm coming to you by tape, so don't try to call in. Uh, We will return to taking calls in future shows. They just have a little break here, and so we pre-recorded this. I have some things I'd love to talk to you about based on questions that I get at the AgriLife Extension office and and just watching gardeners over time and being a gardener myself. Uh, And so that's kind of what we're going to do today. I guess uh, first I want to address a couple of really common phone call slash email questions. And that is, the first one is, why are my trees dying? Uh, We are still just getting a lot of requests for help with that. And our trees have been through a number of stresses. Uh, This summer uh, was brutal, the 100 degree plus for so many days, uh, just essentially depleted all soil moisture reserves. It just hit a point where the trees could not get water. Uh, There just wasn't wasn't enough accessible there in the soil. Early in the spring, that was fine. Even early summer, even to mid-summer, we're doing okay because we did have some reserves to draw in. But by the time we got from mid to late summer, it just wasn't. And this puts trees under a stress. Water is needed for biological processes inside the tree. Uh, for example, photosynthesis. That is an important, an important thing because it essentially produces the food that the plant needs. And so when you don't have water, uh, a number of things happen. Uh, the leaves have little openings in them called stomates. And that basically, just think of it as a window. Uh, They open the window up and gases can move from inside the leaf to the outside and from outside the leaf to the inside. That's part of that process where a plant uses more carbon dioxide uh, than uh, uh, it, uh, and not oxygen. It, It actually uses a little bit of oxygen, but by and large, it's using more carbon dioxide. Uh, And so If uh, they're under stress conditions, they don't want to open those windows because that just allows moisture out. And they're trying to hold on to whatever they have. And so drought can affect them in that way. Excessive temperature also affects biological processes. When it gets hot enough, uh, some of the things that are part of the, essentially the, the functioning of the plant, uh, some of those processes begin to shut down. And so we can have stress from heat as well. Not all plants are the same. Uh, you know, some uh, can take excessively hot temperatures and others not. Uh, but that is also a factor. This summer was brutal. Last fall, uh, actually December, last December we had a freeze that came unexpected. Uh, too early, unexpected to the plants, I would say. Uh, so what's happened is rather than hardening off for winter, in which case they could tolerate pretty significant freeze events. They weren't ready, and the freeze hit mid-December, and uh, we saw a lot of plant damage, in fact, death, uh, of the top parts of the plant uh, because of that. So crepe myrtles are probably the easiest one to point out because you can see that all over town. Uh, But we saw crepe myrtles that had dead branches all through the plant. We saw some that were killed all the way to the ground and then started re-sprouting from the base. Uh, that was due to that unexpected freeze. And, and those kinds of things are cumulative in terms of plant stresses. Uh, when, you, when you force a plant to regrow its above ground structure, that takes energy. And that energy uh, initially is coming from stored energy inside the plant. But then in time, you know, it's making a little bit of, of uh, food from the carbo- from the um, photosynthesis process and so it it picks up again but that's a stress now uh, going backwards in time uh, the summer before was brutal I think maybe 45 degrees above 100 something like that uh, in the summer it was it was terribly uh, difficult for plants and go back a little further to February of 21 and we had that uh, record uh, breaking freeze 
that was so bitter, bitter cold that it literally killed a lot of things above ground, including trees. Uh, some of the Chinese pistache around the area I've noticed I noticed at that time uh, had major splits in the bark with the bark peeling away, exposing the interior wood because it just flat killed it. And so those are just three examples, uh, but one stress after another after another accumulates. And I, I know, uh, well, to, to uh, sort of anthropomorphize a bit, I guess, when our bodies are weak, when we don't get sleep, we don't eat right, um, and you're just not taking care of ourselves, we're more likely to get sick than were we in good health, exercising, eating right, getting plenty of sleep, and so on. And so the same, in a sense, is true with our trees that we're dealing with. Because as those get weaker and weaker, as they lose the ability to make the carbohydrates, the food, we'll call that eating right, but basically what it amounts to is producing things that fuel the plant, that plant gets weaker. And over time, that weakening adds up. And it adds up in the sense of the tree being susceptible to insects and disease problems. Uh, in fact, I expect going into next year, we're gonna see a lot of hypoxylin canker on oaks. That's an opportunist disease that moves in when the tree is weak. It's, it's there, actually, uh, but it gets the upper hand, if you will. Uh, and so because of those stresses and weakening, the tree hits a point where while the tree is very resilient, it hits a point where it's not. And it just, at some point, it just starts a decline that it's like you can't stop it. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And when that happens, we see those trees that are just turning brown all of a sudden. And that didn't just happen in the summer. Uh, it continued on into the fall as we saw uh, the, just the systems of trees collapse and they would seem to turn brown overnight. But just know that it wasn't overnight. Uh, maybe the browning was, was fairly brief uh, in terms of how long it it took to go completely brown, but the tree was weakening and weakening and weakening. And so we see cedars, eastern red cedar, all through the countryside, and they just turn brown, uh, that, that bronze uh, color that they turn. And they're not going to come back. They don't have the ability to re... Even if the plant were alive and just the foliage had been lost, uh, eastern red cedar, pine trees, uh, junipers, a lot of plants like that cannot re-sprout new growth except from the base of where living needles are. And so when you prune one of those like a hat rack, uh, it's done. It's not going to come back. And so those of you who have brown ones, you might as well plan on taking them out because it's, it's not going to come back. Uh, and people are going, well, why did it wait until fall? Why did, how did it, it made it through summer. So, well, it, again, it's just a weakening of the systems. And at, at some point, uh, we begin to see the visual. But in general, it was happening all along. It just wasn't as visible on the outside until the plant systems collapsed. And now, no water's getting to the leaves and they're turning brown very quickly. Uh, and so that's what we saw a lot of. What can we do for trees like that? Well, at this point, not much. Uh, when we are in warmer temperatures and we go into excessive heat and we get the drought that goes oftentimes with that, a rescue watering now and then can be helpful. You don't think of your tree as like your lawn where the sprinklers come in on every week. Uh, just occasionally, maybe tent. You know, you go 14 days and, and the heat of summer and there's no rain and it's hot. Just give a good soaking. If you can focus it on the area beneath the branch spread, that would be that would be great. If you can water a little larger area, that's even better. But a good soaking means about mm, between an inch and two inches of water to wet that soil deep enough to really benefit benefit that root system. Again, we're not making them dependent on the garden hose. We're, we're basically uh, just rescuing them. And that is within our power to do. Fertilizing is not going to help. In fact, it can actually work against what you're trying to accomplish with these trees. Uh, they just have to be able to get back on their feet, so to speak, and begin to, regen to generate the carbohydrates 
and strengthen themselves over time. And we need to not have a summer like we just had again. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect we probably will. Um, so that's kind of the story on trees. That's a long story. We have like four handouts, one I wrote and a couple of others I pulled from the Forest Service and some others uh, on sort of explaining the whole tree decline cycle and what's going on and what we can do. And uh, those are at the AgriLife Extension Office. If you call there and just say, I want the four publications on, on tree stress, uh, they, we, can, we can send those to you. But again, at this point, nothing much to do. You know, somebody can say, well, I'm going to come inject your trees or I'm going to, uh, what, fertilize for you. Well, it's not a lack of nutrients that, that is essentially killing the tree. It's, it's just those stresses, of, especially water and temperature. All right, well, I've, I've kind of beat that horse to death. The other question that we get a lot of and still are getting are, is why is my lawn declining? Why is it dying? Uh, and again, the same answer, hot, hot, hot and dry, 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 uh, add that to some restrictions in water use where we go into different stages of drought um, response. And the lawns just didn't get enough moisture to keep them going. And we saw large areas where the grass just died in people's yards, especially in the sun. Shady areas tend to hold up with a fraction of the watering that a sunny area is getting, and they, they still do okay. Uh, but that that is what happened. Like trees, stressed lawns also are more susceptible to problems, specifically a disease called take-all root rot. Take-all root rot is a fungus, and it attacks the plant. And uh, just like the name implies, it causes the roots to shrivel away and, and decay because of the disease. But then the plant has no way to take up water. And hopefully you can, it could bring water from down the runner, from where there are living roots perhaps, but in most cases those older roots are also dying. And so you're left with a lawn that is just not able to really take up water very well. Uh, things that stress lawns in addition to the drought are misuse of certain herbicides. Certain herbicides will affect the grass's ability to put roots down from the runner down into the soil, uh, and especially misuse of those. Uh, other things would be use of uh, some of the broadleaf post-emergent weed killers, the ones where you spray because you got weeds in your lawn right now. Uh, those, when the temperatures are above 85, certainly above 90, uh, they can be very damaging to the grass plant and weaken it significantly, which again, leads to more problems. And so our lawns are, are going through all of all of those things and, and more, uh, and it's been very difficult for them. In some cases, uh, you just have to resod. Uh, in other cases, you, you might put some pieces here and there where there's larger areas, uh, gaps where there's no living grass. Uh, if you have sprigs that are that are going to be healthy, let's say, and they're about a foot apart going into next spring, that grass with good fertilizing and watering can close back over by midsummer pretty well. But you just kind of have to assess it. If it's weak and sick, it's not going to grow and close over. And for a lot of people, that's not an acceptable condition for it to be that uh, brown, very little green in it. One other thing to think about when you have lawns that have been killed back is now the sunlight can hit the soil. And nature uh, abhors bare soil and will throw weed seeds on it and make them grow to re-green the earth in that spot to protect from erosion and all the other things. Uh, that's just what happens in nature. And so if you have bare areas and you're going to wait and let them grow in, you are going to be dealing with some weeds in the meantime. So be very careful with what kinds of herbicides you use. Uh, read the label. I know we don't like to read instructions. I know it makes sense that if a teaspoon's good, wouldn't a tablespoon be better? The answer is no. No, as a matter of fact, a good teaspoon of a pre-emergent herbicide, when you make it a tablespoon, it actually is, is preventing your grass from rooting, not just the weed seeds. Uh, so be careful with that. So those are a few things that, those are two big questions that, that keep coming in. I have noticed that uh, large patch, which we have always called brown patch, now their brown patch is actually a different version of, a, of the fungus than uh, what we have now as large patch. Uh, they're, they're all rhizoctonia. I think they're all rhizoctonias. I know large patch is. And 
there are different strains of that that can affect the plant different times of the year, different types of plants and so on. But when you see the big round-ish circles in your lawn, sometimes they're perfect little round circles. Uh, sometimes they are somewhat roundish, but maybe they join together uh, two different uh, infection points. And so you sort of lose that circular look. But when you see that, that is a fungus that is causing the leaves to rot off of the runner. Uh, the grass runners uh, will regrow new leaves in time, but that time isn't until the weather warms up in the spring and we get a little bit of growth. You may get a little bit of greening when we have a mild winter, but in general, you just have to wait because it didn't kill your grass. It just rotted the leaves off the runner and new leaves being grass blades will come back in and fill in. So think about that. Uh, that uh, If you have that disease and you have it all the time, like every year you have it, uh, I would, number one, look at some cultural practices that you're doing. And number two, in the meantime, I would go ahead and use a preventative fungicide to prevent the circles. Once the circles are there, you can spray a very effective uh, fungicide against large patch on the lawn but you still have the circles. And so it didn't really change what you're seeing. It might help prevent future infections, uh, additional circles from appearing. But, but uh, it, that is one of the few times when I would recommend a product before the, I see a problem. Most of the time we don't do that. Uh, but with large patch uh, and take all root rot, by the way, they, it also can affect in the fall, but especially in the spring, get those night times in the 50s, and, and it, it can be very happy there. And so we put the, put the, put the pre-emergent down in order to prevent that from, from excuse me, not pre-emergent, the fungicide down ahead of time to prevent that infection. So that's the things going on in uh, the lawns and with the trees. And boy, it's just, it's so widespread. And especially with the trees, I mean, that is a huge value to the landscape. It's just huge. And so when you lose a prized tree, I mean, that's a, it's a, a sad situation that you just can't fix it. You just can't replace it so easily. You can plant another one, but it takes a long time uh, to achieve what the first tree had achieved. So think about those things and uh, be careful when you use products. Just always be careful. Everything has secondary unintended consequences, or it can. And so even an organic, very low toxicity insecticide, for example, can have unintended consequences. So let's take um, um, insecticidal soap. You know, you have aphids on your plants or mites spider mites. Insecticidal soap is super safe. I mean, in terms of toxicity, you take baths in soap or showers with soap and you're fine. But when you get that soapy material on a insect body, it causes uh, so much damage that it literally kills, can kill the insects. But it also kills small, soft-bodied beneficials. So if you have lacewing larvae, if you have lady beetle larva. If you have aphids that now have a parasitoid wasp inside that is about to come out and reproduce and attack a bunch more aphids, that could be killed. And what, that's why we want to be so careful and just recognize there's no such thing as a fully safe, uh, no consequence pesticide. Organic, synthetic, there's not one. They, you just have to recognize that, that unintended consequences can occur. Uh, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, doing some uh, growing of your own seedlings for the garden coming in spring. Now, we're early on, but I want to talk about it now because I think what I'm going to say may involve a couple of holiday gifts, <laughs> and it certainly uh, will get you ready for when it's time to start the transplants that we're going to be growing. So for example, tomato transplants, we would, we're going to put those out probably in March uh, here uh, sometime. And you need to grow them for about six weeks, could be eight weeks uh, to get a decent sized transplant. And so you're backing up into January essentially and uh, late or at least 
early February for sure. And you're getting all of the, the, the uh, seeding and growing and all of that done. So let's talk now so you can kind of prepare for that. Uh, you know, the, the, when the gardening bug hits us, uh, we uh, just get that spring fever and just can't wait to plant something. And a lot of times people will pick up some seedling trays, get some seeds of the latest, greatest varieties, and uh, uh, also seed starting medium. And next thing you know, they're up and growing. But our dreams of that beautiful, healthy, stocky transplant begin to fade because we watch these precious babies become lanky, weak spindles reaching toward the light. And there is almost never an adequate spot in a house to grow seedlings without supplemental lighting. I've tried it before. I've used a lot of different ways to make it happen. Certainly a good bright window is important. Uh, you got to turn the seedlings all the time because they keep leaning no matter, no matter how you put them by the window. And so I want to talk about, uh, first of all, the science of lighting and for, for um, plants, and I promise I won't be boring, <laughs> or at least I don't think I will be. <laughs> when it comes to factors in, in plant lighting, and, and quality plant lighting is perhaps the most important thing for growing a good transplant inside. Of course, you got to water them, and of course, the media needs to drain well. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that could be game enders, but Quality lighting is the thing most people don't have, and it's the one thing that we we uh, often have trouble with. There's three factors in plant lighting. The quality of the light, the quantity of the light, and the duration of the light. So not all light is equal. Our eyes and plants see light, if you will, uh, differently. And the terms you may be familiar with when it comes to lighting like your home are not the same terms and won't be of much help when it comes to lighting your plants. So for example, you buy a light bulb or a fluorescent tube, the old time fluorescent tubes that now are more, more and more going away it seems. And you'll see things like watts, lumens, lux, and, and then the term temperature. So watts are the energy the light uses and it ends up either as heat or light. So you could have two lights that have the same wattage, but if one is more efficient and stays relatively cool and the other one gets relatively hot, that electricity you're paying for is going into heat in the latter one, and it's, it's going into uh, producing light, which is what we want to do with the other one. So like an incandescent light bulb, that's, that's a terrible plant light, uh, not, not good at all. Uh, lumens are a measurement of the bright list, bright the light source puts out. But what we see as bright may not be light with the wavelength that plants need. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, this later, but uh, one, one phrase I like to use is that lumens are for humans and par is for plants. Par, P-A-R. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, all the things you buy a light for to put in your home, or f it's for your eyes that all those things are being you know, the lux and lumens and temperature and all that. Uh, plants, it's a different thing. So lux is just the intensity of lumens over a given area uh, from the light source. Light temperature uh, is a, not a measure of the heat the light puts out, but rather, rather the visual quality. So we express light temperature in terms of degrees Kelvin. So, okay, here's a nerd alert. Um, the Kelvin scale reflects the color of light emitted by a, quote, black body radiator heated to various temperatures. So when you heat this black body radiator to certain temperatures, different lights come out. And that's why we say that it is the, the temperature of the light. Uh, and that it, it's kind of a, a weird way of doing it. But okay, end of the nerd alert on that one. Uh, higher higher te Kelvin temperatures d tend to create a more bluish light, while lower temperatures create a more yellowish light. And the Kelvin range can be helpful uh, because it gives us an idea of the wavelength range in the light, but it can also be really confusing. The, and here's why. Uh, the, we would say that a high temperature would be a bluish light and a low temperature a yellowish light. But when you go to ho home lighting and you see a light that's more bluish, 
it's referred to as cooler, and a yellowish light as warmer. You've, you've seen that, you know, the warm glow of a room that got more of the yellow end of the spectrum, and then as you get into re the really bright, bright bluer ones, that, we, that would be the cool. So it's the opposite of Kelvin. So I, I just hate Kelvin. I don't even, I, I don't even, I probably shouldn't even have brought it up, but it's on lighting. So that's what we're talking about there. So anyway, uh, we're talking about visual color. Uh, you may recall that back in science class when you're a kid, you would shine a light through a prism and out the other side of the prism would come all the colors refracted out into a rainbow. And so what we see as white light is actually a blend of colors, blue, green, yellow, red, and so on. And so the, the, um, the different colors in that white light affect different processes in the plant. Now, not every color I'm talking about, but basically that's what's going on in there. So light wavelength is the best way to connect lighting to plant growth. So white light, being that prism, uh, could have varying amounts of different wavelengths in the light. Uh, and visible light from the short wavelengths of violet, for example, uh, range all the way to the long wavelengths of red. And uh, there's ultraviolet and infrared that are outside of those. Uh, but the light in the wavelength range of 400 to 700, 400 to 700, that's the wavelength. It's referred to as photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR. And I'm going to use the term PAR from now on. It just means in that wide range, and we're going to go all the way across the spectrum from infrared all the way to ultraviolet and all the colors we see in between, there are certain wavelengths in there in the 400 to 700 wavelength range that the plant uses in a photosynthetically active uh, process. Okay, so uh, there are other factors that are that are important in there. Uh, there, the uh, wavelength range drives things such as germination. A lot of seeds. Uh, let, let me just use lettuce as an example. Red lighting, red wavelengths are needed for that seed to germinate, and that's why we plant lettuce on the surface, barely covered, if any at all, because it needs to have be exposed to that light. Uh, you bury a, a lettuce seed a you know, half inch deep and you're probably never going to see a lettuce plant. Uh, it's also part of seedling root development, the lengthening of the stems. It affects opening and closing of stomates, which we talked about. But uh, I'm getting off into a bunch of uh, detail there. So let's, let's get back on the, the home-grown uh, lighting issues. So the red and the blue are probably the two key wavelengths. Now, they can use all of the PAR spectrum, even green, which is a color that is most often reflected away. Uh, but uh, primarily, the red and blue are the two keys. Now, uh, the, uh, we're going to talk about, I think I'll come back to uh, talking about those colors. Eh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and talk about them right now. The blue is, is a uh, very important when it comes to growth, to vegetative growth, the stretching out of the stems and, and the growing of the leaves and everything. Blue is, is important for that. The red primarily is, is very important for, in addition to for some seeds to germinate, is important for fruiting, flowering and fruiting. So if, if you want to have a healthy plant that grows you know, over a period, let's say you want to have a tomato inside and have it make fruit inside, you would need a red and blue combination for both of those to do really, really well. Now, I mentioned there were several factors. Another factor is the quantity of light. So I just talked about quality. The quantity of light is the amount of actual light photons hitting the plant leaf surface. Think of it as raindrops hitting the ground. I love the rain analogy because it makes sense, okay? So uh, it, when we're looking at quantity, uh, that's the amount of raindrops hitting the ground or the light hitting the leaf as it shines on them. So think of it as maybe how long uh, a rainstorm might last. Uh, and duration is involved there. So if you have a rainstorm and you just get a gully washer for 10 minutes, you're going to get a certain quantity of water on the ground. If, on the other hand, you had a drizzle that went all day, you may end up with the same amount of water on the ground, but it just took a lot longer. And to some degree, when lighting 
uh, intensity or quantity is not sufficient, running the lighting longer uh, can help. That doesn't mean you can take that too far and expect, you know, it, if you leave light on 24 hours a day, that, that will catch up. No, you, you can't do that. But you want to make sure that the amount of light received over the day is, is sufficient. And the transplants in the window are leaning and spindly because they don't receive enough light. It's inadequate. So going back to that rain analogy where I was saying you, know, you could get an inch fast or you could get a sprinkle over time of the same amount, uh, you need to make sure they get that adequate amount. Now one other thing is if the light um, uh, uh, is further from the plants, the, the amount of light hitting the plant goes down dramatically. I may, I may go into that a little bit more. So in types of plant lighting, I have always started seeds with fluorescent lights. Those, those shop lights, those tubes, I think that's a T12, called a T12 tube. Uh, there's other kinds of tubes as well. Uh, now we have tubes that really have LEDs in them. They're not the old time fluorescent lights. But when I was doing plant lighting, I would have two shop lights, four foot, and I would put a warm white bulb and a cool white bulb. So I would get more of the reds and a little more of the blues, and then another shop fixture next to it with a warm white and a cool white alternating. So then through that lighting pattern, you're getting a nice mix of a little of the reds and the blues. And you would I, I would suspend those things just a couple of inches above the plant leaves. Uh, to get good intensity on those plants. And uh, remember, our eyes are not the gauge. Our eyes are not the gauge. So uh, I, I told someone one time that when you, when you move, like, let's say one of those fluorescent fixtures, when you move it, when you double the distance from the plants, it still looks like it's lighting them just about as good. But in fact, it's less than half, way less than half of the lighting that's actually hitting those plants. So the closer you can get them, the better. That was what was nice about fluorescent lights. Uh, it's because they weren't hot. You could get them really close, and they did really, really well. Now, uh, fluorescent lighting is, is, has improved in different ways, but there are some tubes called T5 tubes. T5 is about a half an inch wide tube, in fact, that's what the number represents, uh, the um, uh, amount uh, of inches, like T5 is 0.5, uh, and T12 would be 12, 12 eighths, so that'd be an inch and a half, I guess, in diameter. Anyway, uh, T5 tubes are pretty good. Uh, that you can get a fixture that'll hold several tubes. You can trade them out, alternate between cool and warm light, and that would help. Uh, there's a lot of other versions. So there's high output T5 lighting and a lot of different things like that. But rather than make your head spin with all the different options, I'm going to say that if you if you wanted to go with the fluorescent tubes, then cool white, warm white. And that will get your transplants up and growing pretty well. Now, if you wanted to grow tomatoes indoors, then that would not even come close to being adequate for it. But for just starting a transplant, in other words, we just need some vegetative growth, that'll do pretty well. LED lighting is the new kid on the block, and it's the future. Uh, LED lighting used to be very expensive. Now the, the price is dropping. It uses much less energy. It's very light efficient. And the reason is because it turns that energy, remember what we said about wattage, it turns that energy not into heat, but it turns it into light uh, more than the other types of lighting in the past did. So LED lighting is very, very efficient. You can find a lot of them out there. You can go online and purchase lights, uh, and it is the wild, wild west because inevitably people that are selling them don't tell you what you really need to know about the lighting. And I, that's one of the clues I use as to this isn't a good lighting because they don't, they don't even know uh, themselves or they don't want to tell you if they do know. Uh, but we, we need to recognize that the, the cheapest light is not generally the best for sure. Uh, it's like anything, you get what you pay for. Uh, so if you, uh, if you're going to purchase an LED lighting system, look for information like the PAR, P-A-R. Uh, that's important. There are some other terms, and again, I don't want to make your eyes roll back in your head with all 
the additional terms and things, but uh, that that if you were getting into plant growing professionally and you were needing the the best lighting of all, then you would be doing a lot of additional things other than that. So things like the photosynthetic uh, flux, photo flux density and uh, the daily light duration and, and on and on. Uh, you can have meters that, that help you with that. Uh, but for your plant lighting, I would just look for one that uh, is very helpful. By the way, there is a book uh, that uh, I think is, is an excellent book. Uh, it's by Leslie Halleck. She's a horticulturist up in the Metroplex area. And uh, she has a book called Gardening Under Lights by Leslie Halleck, H-A-L-L-E-C-K. It's a very readable book. Lots of good information for people that want to go deeper into plant lighting. Uh, and I know some people like to even maybe have a little herb garden on the kitchen counter. And you can buy the little kits that have the lights already in them and things. Or you can create your own. Um, and purchase that. So just a few things uh, to think about. Uh, whenever I'm doing growing my transplants, I will I have a, some like a cardboard that I put foil over and I put those walls on all four sides of the tray. You can, you know, duct tape it together or whatever. And then the light goes on the top. So light, as it's going out, is hitting the foil and reflecting backward. And so you're getting a little more intensity of lighting uh, just by, by doing that. That's just a, a minor little tweak, but I found it to be very helpful. One thing you do want to know, know, though, about growing good, stocky, healthy transplants is they need to move. The plants need to move. Nature is very, very uh, resilient. And when you look at plants that are pushed and bent in the wind, the tissues in those plants get stronger. That would be true of a tree trunk. And maybe you bought a little tree that had a trunk the size of a, of a um, broom handle or a, a mop handle on it. And if you tied it to be perfectly still, the tissues don't develop the same strength as if that tree were moving in the wind. That's why when we stake trees, it's best to let them move just a little bit in the wind uh, and, and to do that. Now, our little tiny transplants are the same way. Uh, if you have peppers or tomatoes or whatever kind of transplant you're growing, you can just run your hand over the surface of them. Some people use a little pencil or something like that, and it just sort of bends them this way and that. I'll do it a couple of times a day at the house. Just move them around a little bit. Some people will have a um, oscillating fan. You know, as it goes by, it moves them and then goes away and then comes back again. Uh, and that may be a greenhouse way to do it uh, as well. But that movement causes the stem to become stronger and stockier. And so the the uh, fancy word, uh, well, that just the, the whole idea is just a concept of nature. So think about your muscles, for example. If you just have a tie your arm behind your back and don't ever use it, well, you know that it gets weaker and weaker and and uh, over time. But if you go to the gym and work out and you you wear that muscle out and you're, you're causing it to contract a lot and it just gets stronger and stronger over time, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of concept. Um, yeah, that I think that uh, probably makes more sense. All right, so uh, temperatures are important for seed starting. You want to make sure that uh, if you can, ideally, it would be somewhat of a cool room for your warm season transplants, but, but warmth underneath in the soil or in the growing media. So people put these mats underneath. And I will off, I have started things before in my garage, which gets pretty darn cool. Uh, but with that warmth underneath rising up, it does just fine. And really warm, luxurious temperatures, lots of humidity, and the plants aren't moving, that's when you grow very weak transplants. So uh, just something to think about. Now, all those things are available. You can go online and purchase a light. You can go online and purchase the trays and the little insets that you grow your transplants in. Uh, many times you can get those with a little clear plastic cover so you have a little mini greenhouse. Just remember the, to brush the seedlings as they're up and growing uh, to increase that, that stem strength. But uh, maybe someone on your list is a gardener. Maybe you're the gardener, and you can drop a hint to someone on your list. Uh, but those could be a really cool gift, you know, some seed starting media, maybe some seeds, uh, or uh, a good quality uh, plant lighting. Once you start 
propagating your own plants. It is an addictive hobby. It's a lot of fun. Uh, whether it's starting from seed or whether it's taking cuttings and rooting them and growing a plant from a cutting or there's a lot of other ways to propagate uh, vegetatively like that. Uh, the thing I like about seed starting is I'm always wanting to try new varieties, new things. You know, there's only about 800 bazillion tomato varieties out there uh, and you're only going to find a few in a garden center, you know, at any, some garden centers really go all out, but a lot of times there's just a few options. And maybe you want to try a new one that has just come out. And those don't tend to make it to the mainstream because, you know, when someone goes and buys a tomato, they want a big boy or a celebrity because they've always heard of those names and, and they want to try that. Uh, but with seed starting, you get to try things that nobody else has access to. And that's another fun thing about that. I hope I hope that's uh, helpful. Uh, I did an article for Texas Gardener a while back, uh, and uh, that went into uh, some detail on uh, the plant lighting, which uh, is one of the keys. Uh, I'm going to want to discuss a little bit a couple of other things some things we can be we can be out and about doing right now uh, in the landscape uh, we you know the d holiday decorating time is here so anytime you have a plant that produces berries uh, that could be a pyracantha or a yopon or certain other hollies remember that some types of berries are poisonous so be careful with that especially if there are little kids around uh, and then there's uh, just a lot of evergreen boughs that people bring in to make a wreath or other things. Maybe you want to think about planting things that would give you indoor decorations like that. Just kind of thinking ahead for future holiday seasons, but I think that's important. Uh, you're, you want to make sure that all of your tools that you've been using this summer, your hoe, uh, your shovels and things like that, clean all the rust off the blade get with a wire brush, uh, and then lubricate them with oil. Any kind of oil you know, it could be motor oil, but it could be a, like a, a, um, a WD-40 kind of thing. That's not really an oil, but that can kind of help halt the rust. Uh, and uh, people have different ways they go about doing that. But also, you want to make sure and sharpen any cutter, any mower. Uh, geez, mower. Uh, well, that too. You could sharpen your mower blade uh, well ahead of time now. But the uh, pruners and the loppers, sharpen those blades so they're ready to go. Next month, we'll be doing a lot of pruning again and you want to make sure that uh, the blades are sharp. When the blades aren't sharp, they don't cut well, and the strain on your shoulders and elbows and wrists and hands is greater, and uh, you don't want to get into that. Use good, sharp pruners. This is a time for planting out in the garden. You know, uh, sometimes we're going to have some cool, rainy, cold, rainy days uh, coming up, and that's where you get out the old seed catalogs and books and magazines and whatnot. And by the way, Texas Gardener magazine would be a good, a good uh, Christmas gift for a gardener on your list. Uh, that that is a good one. Uh, let's see. I I want to want to talk about uh, some other things that are going on out in the landscape and some of the things that you know that we might want to do the leaves are hitting the ground so don't leave them too long pick them up they're extremely valuable they're mulch they're for making compost and you don't want to let the nutrients that are in those leaves get away that is important it is time to keep planting in the vegetable garden uh, despite the fact that you know we're entering the period where we can have some good hard frost we can still plant uh, the cool coal crops, the blue leaf. I call them blue leaf vegetables because it's a bluish green leaf. That would be collards and cauliflower and broccoli and kale and kohlrabi and Brussels sprouts. Those sort of things can be planted now as well. Uh, if you've got onions on hand and uh, you haven't planted, you can you can also plant onions uh, this time of year. Uh, it A lot of times people will wait and, and do that uh, in the January period of time, that's fine, but you can also plant them a little earlier if you like. Uh, and then the uh, spinach, uh, radishes are actually pretty cold, cold hardy as well. Uh, but spinach would be a, an important one for the cool season. Uh, arugula, uh, some of those kinds of things. Just keep it going. The cool season is a great season to be planting. If you're going to put a fruit tree in, find out does it need a pollinator or not. Uh, apples do, blackberries don't, blueberries generally don't, but you get bigger berries and better yield if you have a pollinator. Uh, citrus doesn't, figs don't, grapes don't. Um, 
the uh, loquat, if any of you have a loquat tree, I grew up, grew up eating loquat fruit. Uh, they don't. Peaches don't. Persimmons do not. Uh, pomegranates do not, too. Strawberries don't. But plums, a few varieties are self-fruitful, and this is true of, of pears, too. A few varieties are self-fruitful, uh, but it's better to just make sure and hedge your bet with two varieties. So let's see, I'm gonna mention a few things about uh, bulbs. Uh, if you purchase bulbs and you didn't get them in the ground, go ahead and do it. It's better to get it done late than not get it done at all. Uh, so get those in the ground. Uh, if you're someone who purchases the uh, one-shot wonders like tulips and hyacinth and crocus, they're great for one season of bloom, or actually a couple of weeks of bloom in our climate. Uh, but go ahead and get those out. You may have had them in the refrigerator. Uh, for chilling and uh, just go ahead and get those out. I typically plant uh, in late December is about the best time. You can stagger it out a little bit into January if you like, uh, but it's it's much better to get that done in, in uh, late December. A good thing to do between the holidays, especially if, uh, let's say family, uh, what do they say, Family and fish, both of them get old when they sit around too long. Well, <laughs> if that's the case, you've got a good excuse. Go buy some tulips and <laughs> go outside and, and plant those things. Uh, if you've got any fruit on your trees that are dried and shriveled, get those out. If you had a pear tree that had fire blight and you had these chocolate brown ends of shoots with chocolate brown leaves on them, go below the brown into the green about four to six inches and just cut it off there and get them out of your orchard because that'll just splash the bacteria around when spring rains come. Uh, by the way, I, I always dip my pruner. I used to always dip my pruners in isopropyl alcohol uh, between cuts to avoid uh, spreading diseases. Uh, I think an easier way now is just to get something like a Lysol spray uh, that you can spray the pruners with and disinfect them. Remember when you're done, you want to oil them and you want to uh, make sure that any rust or sap or things like that are removed from them. Oil them really well so, so they don't rust and they stay uh, in good condition over time. Uh, and if you've got color in the landscape, let's say violas and pansies and alyssum, uh, those kinds of things, uh, fertilize them a little bit. It helps to give them a little boost. Now that the temperatures are cooling off, uh, the activity of my microbes in the soil slows down just a little bit. Our soil is pretty mild in temperature, but it slows a bit. So a little extra boost to nitrogen is important. And, and think about this. People say, well, and, and you'll see this, uh, a fertilizer is sold as something for blooms and it'll have a real high phosphorus, the middle number. Well, that's fine if you need phosphorus, and it also is helpful at planting time, so you have that in the soil. Uh, but in general, the thing that gives you good blooms on your winter flowers is a moderate amount of nitrogen, because every time you create new shoot growth, you have more places where new blooms can now form. Some, some of these things just bloom themselves to death. I mean, they really do. Uh, you look at some of these flowers, and I've, I had some petunias last spring, and it was hard to see the, the plant. It was just solid pink flowers, wall to wall over the top of it. And I don't know how those things survive, because they're essentially shading the light off their own leaves. So that doesn't doesn't do well. Any beds that are going to be renovated, uh, maybe you're pulling out uh, a particular planting and going to put a new one in, go ahead and put about an inch of compost on it and work it into the soil uh, to prepare for that, that new planting. I think that uh, will be very, very helpful. We always want to improve on things uh, a little bit. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be uh, doing vegetable gardening really 12 months out of the year here in this area and it's just always a good idea to continue to build your soil better and better over time. Uh, if you haven't done any ornamental grass planting, you ought to consider that. Uh, ornamental grasses, I really like them in, this, in the winter time when they go completely tawny colored, uh, but the frost forms on those grass heads and the light coming through the grass heads uh, early in the day or late in the day, it's really beautiful, really, really beautiful. And so I don't think we use enough ornamental grasses in our plantings uh, that we have. If you haven't started a compost pile and you want to, boy, now's the time. Well, lots of leaves available for doing that. 
Uh, if you can mix green stuff with the brown stuff, brown stuff being leaves, brown stuff essentially meaning it's high in carbon, uh, not all brown stuff is very low nitrogen. There are like cow manure is brown, but it, it's got a lot of nitrogen in it. So when we say brown stuff, we're talking about carbon materials, which typically is leaves. And then the green stuff would be living plants, things like that, vegetable trimmings and whatnot. Not everybody has access to those, uh, the green stuff, so you can sprinkle a little bit of fertilizer as you build your compost bin or compost pile. And uh, water, keep it moist, water it as you build it. If you build a big old compost pile in, in a compost unit, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get that wet in the center. It just sheds water very well. So each time you do a layer, you just sprinkle it a little bit. Throw a little, very light amount of fertilizer on it, sprinkle it really good, add some more layers, and do you can do that again. Uh, and that will help it to decompose a lot faster. The more you break up the material, the more you chop it up, uh, the faster it decomposes because there's more surface area for the microbes to have access to. And that's especially true with leaves that are glossy, uh, like an oak leaf or a pine needle uh, or magnolia leaf. Uh, it, breaking those up uh, you know, gets you past just having that gloss surface that things are trying to access. Uh, and it speeds it up a lot. I always mow over my leaves. Like that's how I pick up my leaves, is by using a lawnmower and starting on the outside of the yard and mowing in circles all the way to the middle as the, the discharge chute blows the leaves forward uh, it, toward the center. And by the time you get to the center, you can just rake them right onto a tarp. It's real easy to drag them around and to uh, get them where you want them to go. Uh, those are a few things uh, to be thinking about at this time of the year. Uh, if you are going to plant uh, any kind of a woody ornamental, that could be a tree, a shrub, it could be a woody vine, it could be a rose bush, uh, and this is a good time to get it done. The sooner the better. I know we think about planting roses in February, and that's fine. You can do that. There's no problem there. But there's no reason you can't plant one now either uh, because it just gives it a little bit, a little bit more time in order to establish itself before that inevitable next summer comes. That first summer is basically the make or break summer for new plants that we put out there. And so any kind of a head start we can give them is a good idea. Remember when you dig a hole, only dig it as deep as the root cylinder in the container. So find the topmost root on the plant. Sometimes the thing's been buried as they've repotted it into bigger containers. Find the topmost root and how far is it from that root to the bottom of the container and that is how deep you dig the hole so that it doesn't settle after you've planted it. Make a big wide hole especially in a clay soil. Sometimes those holes can become sort of slick, uh, sided, and uh, we want to uh, make an ugly hole, you know, make it wider or just take your shovel and chop into the sides of the hole a little bit uh, and create that, that environment uh, where the roots can easily spread out. Now, deer are an issue. Often they're an issue in the cool season because you know, they're hungry and uh, there's not as much browse or, you know, the number one food for deer are shrubs and trees, leaves, basically leaves, uh, very different from cattle that are feeding on grasses primarily. Uh, and so deer get hungry and they'll come in to where where uh, they, uh, they'll do a number on your plants and you just have to make plans for that. Uh, in some situations, a scare tactic will keep them away at least for a while, but not usually for a long, long time. They get used to it. Uh, but uh, fencing is certainly a possibility. If you have a little garden, you can put a about a six-foot, uh, seven-foot fence in your garden. Maybe six foot would be enough. And the deer, if the garden is small enough, they won't jump in. Uh, just think of it, you know, if they jump from one side and the fence on the other side is right pretty close to there, they often won't try to do that and it doesn't take as tall of a fence in those situations. There's a lot more you can do for deer. I'm not going to go into all that stuff now, but uh, just be aware this is a season where they're going to be very happy. Uh, of course, this is also a season where hunters are going to be very happy too coming up here. Or actually, we're in it right now. 
Uh, you're listening to Garden Success, and, and we're normally our call-in show, but we're coming to you by tape today. And I'm just talking about a number of different topics, things that I think might be of interest to you. Uh, we will be uh, uh, back live again soon, uh, but in the meantime, I just sit back and, and enjoy. There is a lot of good information out there in magazines and in books uh, as well. And I would encourage you to find some things that are written for your local area. Uh, I know that Doug Welch uh, wrote uh, the Texas, I think he's called it Texas, Doug Welch's Texas Almanac or something like that. It's a real good book telling you what to do at this time of year. If you go to uh, an and Press, there's a number of books. There's one on vegetables by Dr. Masabni. There's some on fruit. There's some on grapes that are, that are really excellent uh, for planting uh, as well. I have one called Month by Month Gardening Texas from Cool Springs Press. Uh, that one is written, This was, that was a bit, one of the biggest challenges, uh, <laughs> was writing that because I try to cover the whole state in it, and I do, uh, but it is a bit of a challenge without becoming excessively wordy uh, when you're trying to address issues month by month of the year in all these, all these different areas. This is a big state. You probably know that. If you're not from here, I'm sure the people who you are around now that you arrived in Texas are more than willing to tell you just how big and wonderful uh, the state of Texas is. <laughs> uh, we've, you know, we had a movement in our cold hardiness zones in this area uh, where you may not have changed zones, but your temperature has changed about three or four degrees typically. And for a large part of the country and parts of Texas, they did change zones. So if you lived on the border between 9 and 8B, you're now in 9. Uh, it moved. Okay. If you're right in the middle of 8B, you're probably still in 8B, but maybe in the, in the uh, toward 9 end of the range. What does that mean? All that means is the coldest temperature of the, of the season, of the year, on average. So like in, let's say, last year, the lowest it got, and I, I can't remember the temperatures, but let's say the last year, the lowest it, got, lowest it got was 15 degrees. And the year before that was 28 degrees, the lowest it got. And the year before that was uh, 25 degrees. That, those averaged over the last 30 years determined the zone. That, that's how zones are arrived at. What zones don't tell you is all the other factors. Is it heat tolerant? Can it take blazing heat? Do you know that we are, we are in Zone 9? Do you know that the west coast of Canada also has a Zone 9? Right up there, Washington State, uh, there is the Zone 9. But that's a very different climate than here. It's just that their winter temperature low, right, being on the water there, is no lower than our winter temperature here in some parts of this area. So that's just something to think about. Remember, zone's important, but zone is not all that there is. Well, you've been listening to Garden Success. I enjoy visiting with you each Thursday here from 12 to 1 on KAMU-FM. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.